I've got a fantastic show lined up for you guys today. The gentleman joining us today is someone I met at Vernal, Utah a couple years ago. He's got a background both in uh, cryptozoology with the Bigfoots investigating for a number of years, as well as paranormal, strange phenomena, UFOs, and I'm speaking, of course, of Mr. Ed Brown. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Paranormal Portal. I'm your host, Brent Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've got an epic show ahead, but just remember, if any of you have experiences you'd like to share, I'd love to hear from you. You can either email me at paranormalportalradio at gmail.com or head over to paranormalportal.net. Scroll down and find the button that says interview me, and that'll allow you to look at a calendar of possible times and dates and uh, find a date that works for you. Love to hear your stories, so definitely get in touch with me. Buckle up, folks. We're going in. Hey, Ed, welcome to the show. Hey, Bram, man. Look, appreciate you having me on, man. This is, this is awesome. I've been looking forward to this <laughs> since we met in Vernon and we started talking about this. This was awesome. Yeah. Glad to be here. Oh, thank you, brother. Yeah, we. it took me a while to circle back to it, and I apologize for that, but I'm I'm absolutely thrilled you're joining us today because, uh, you know, you, you have a, a, an incredibly varied and, and robust field of experience in in these things that we talk about all the time on the show, so... Um, what would you say, how did this start for you? Um, was there some event or, or something that made you think, man, I want to look into this stuff or, or how did it begin? That's a great question. Actually, you know, as a whole, I think my, uh, my personality has just always been of a curious nature. I want to know the answers. I want to know, you know, uh, for example, uh, when I was a kid, we were doing a, a reading fair at school and uh reading marathon I meant and uh the longer you know you had to keep reading until you were if you stopped reading you were ejected you know you lose so I wanted to keep reading so I could say I'm competitive <laughs> <laughs> and uh I read a book about the Bob Gimlin and and Roger Patterson you know the Patty film and uh I was like I remember I was so so into it that I was like man did they, you know monsters are real you know yeah and um so, so that's kind of what got me into the Bigfoot aspect of it. But the paranormal, I've always been interested in because my entire life I've heard, you know, ra- random times, you know, it's like just as clear as day, you know, Ed, or Eddie, you know, and it's like, what in the world, you know? Oh. So, uh, you know, the paranormal has always been a, a big uh, factor in my life, even though I've, I kind of made a name in the Bigfoot thing. I, you know, I always did paranormal too. Nobody, just nobody knew it. <laughs> so which one did you start with? I mean, as far as actively researching the topic. Um, I did some paranormal investigations uh way before I ever got into Bigfooting, but I did them very far and few between, you know, and then when I got into Bigfoot I I kinda you know, again, people kinda got to know me because I had I had my show, uh Sit Down with Ed Brown and uh people kind of got to know me. So I kind of, I kind of jumped into that and took a, took that by the horns and, and, uh, really ran with it. Yeah. That's fascinating. And I, you know, one thing that's, that I find really intriguing and, and I, since you have experience in so many of these different parts of the paranormal and supernatural and Fordian topics, do you, do you find it fascinating or interesting or what do you think? Well, I mean, obviously you do. <laughs> that was a stupid question, but um, do, do you, uh, notice the parallels between the different phenomena? Like with, with Bigfoot research, sometimes there is what appears to be like EMF issues with equipments, with, you know, um, batteries draining and things like that gets reported. Sure. And then of course with, with, you know, ghosts and spirits, the same thing. And then with UFOs, the same thing. Do you think that there's some correlation between the varied phenomena? That, that's a great question. And and the only way I can answer that and answer that honestly is to say that I've never, I have yet to see any evidence to suggest that they are correlated. What, what I personally believe, and, and, and this is just my own beliefs, doesn't mean I'm right. It's just how I feel, you know. Sure. Yeah. But uh, I personally believe that, th- that Bigfoot is a flesh and blood animal. You know, just like we are. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think, I think 
the paranormal things happen in locations that maybe you know you're just you just don't know you know it could be anywhere okay right so when when something when there's lights in the woods and we find it interesting don't you think a bigfoot who might he was also in the woods might find it interesting as well though so mm-hmm. i think people have paranormal experiences while looking for bigfoot you know and then they in their minds and i understand it you know they just it it makes sense to think it but in their minds it's like well then bigfoot turned into that little light you know and right. not necessarily the case in in my opinion i think that i think they're just two different things that are happening in the same location that's what i think you know that's a great take too and i and i really appreciate you saying that because I've been struggling with that for a long time. Of course, I, I can't discount what people have seen, and I can't quantify sure. that. But at the same time, you know, I, you just have this logical part of our minds, and it's like, well, how do I, how do I wrap myself around the fact that this, this cryptid, or this creature, this being, can just melt into thin air? And and how? What do I? I mean, because it's such a foreign concept, and yet people sure. claim to have witnessed that. But but you're right. I think that it could be a more than one phenomena, much like, you know, the, the claims of Bigfoot is riding in on UFOs because I saw a UFO and then pretty soon after I saw a Bigfoot. And, and right. I, I, I think that you're, you're absolutely, you know, that's a very good point because you can't necessarily correlate the two events just because they happened in proximity or within, you know, a space of time, right? 100%. And, and, and listen, listen, when... When I'm out in the woods one time and, and a UFO lands and I see a UFO landing and a Bigfoot comes out and then turns into a ghost and walks away, then I will be 100% on board with um, all this, you know, being now, now you know, I, I, I need I need to preface this. Actually, I make a little joke about it and I'm not teasing anybody. I'm just saying, you know, that's what it would take for me to right. to jump ship on my on my own beliefs until I see something personally to change my my views yeah. then then I'm I'm perfectly willing to I don't care and that and you know what and, and Brett this is such a Brett this is such a good good lesson here because I don't care what the truth is I could care less if it's if they are connected or they're not connected or whatever mm-hmm. I just want to know what the truth is okay when and and I think people go into things with this preconceived notion and when you do that, you're not really a researcher anymore. You're now working on a hypothesis, okay? And there's a huge difference. A researcher has to go in and follow the evidence and, and make discoveries. Yeah. When you're working on a hypothesis, you're looking for things to prove you right, okay? And so there's, so there's a difference in the two. And I think that mindset, if, if, man, if there was a message I could get out today, and I... <laughs> And I'm not, again, I'm not downing anybody for their thoughts or beliefs or anything else. I think every aspect should be researched. I think every view should be looked at. But I think people should maybe think about that and stop coming, going into it with a preconceived notion of what their, of what things are. They should wait and see what it is. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And, and I agree. A, a lot of people... Um, and, and I think there are, there are plenty of people that absolutely are, are looking at that that way, but you're right. There is, there is a lot of people that have their minds made up already and they're just looking for evidence to support that. But to truly look at this scientifically, you, you can't come in with, with supposition and you have to, you have to allow for anything to be the truth, uh, once you discover it. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, you could even use this, you could say, and, and and this is a fact. I don't care anybody anybody researching has to agree with this. If you go out looking for bear, right, mm-hmm. you can find evidence that bears are there, even if they're not. There's things that you can see in nature that would make you think, oh man, you know, a bear did that. A bear could have done that. So there might be bear here. You know, you're going to find whatever it is you're looking for. You're going to find evidence. So the best way to go into it is not be looking for anything. Just if people would just go out into nature and have a good time and let things happen, it's it's such a better way to research. It's much more relaxing. You have more fun. 
you know, take equipment, set up your cameras, do everything you do. Just change your mindset. You, yeah. Does, does that make you, you know what I'm saying? And and I, I you you just you can't go in trying to prove yourself right because you will. Okay. okay. At least to yourself. Sure. You go in with with an open mind and hey, whatever I find, whatever evidence is there, then. I'm going to take that evidence and make my mind up, you know, which you are entitled to do. Sure. Yeah. No, that's perfect. I, I agree. And and I think that, you know, there it's okay to have whatever people the opinion people have, but but I think you're right. I think you can't you can't close your eyes to the possibilities that it might not be what you think it is. Absolutely. It, it, that's one of the things I, I say when I when I speak at a conference or whatever, you know, when anytime I'm doing any public speaking, I, I I always wrap my my presentation around this one key phrase, and that is be critical of your own evidence. All right. If you're not critical of your own evidence and you just accept whatever happens as evidence that you're right, not as in what the evidence is, you're not being critical of your own evidence and you're not uh you're you're, you're again, you're not researching you're working on a hypothesis and there's a difference. Yeah. Excellent points. So, um, you've, you've had experiences researching Bigfoot as well. Yeah. I have. Yeah. I, uh, I was in doing my own talk show. I had, uh, you know, I, I did the sit down with Ed Brown and I also did the first, uh, shows where with the sit down with Ed Brown, I generally talked to uh, you know, the more well-known researchers out there, you know, I talked to everybody, I mean, I've talked to you, you, you name them, they've been on my show pretty much, you know, and I've made a lot of great friends by doing that. The other one, you know, the Sasquatch encounters, I talked to people who had had experiences, you know, and I, and, and I listened to their stories and, you know, and, and it was great. I loved doing it. But after hearing about seven different encounters within a 100 mile range around Harlan, Kentucky. Um, I did it I, at that time. I lived in Ohio near Cincinnati and I thought, I mean, you know, that's not far away. I could go down there and, you know, do a little research myself. So I did. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, on the way there, it started snowing, which it wasn't supposed to do for another few days. And, uh, time we got there, we woke up the next morning and the suburban was completely covered. We didn't even know where it was. It was snow was like, it was insane. It was like above my knees, snow. Oh no! And I, I had gone outside. And, you know, of course, at that point, you're limited. You know, you're there's, there's. I mean, I don't care who you are. There's only so much you can do. You know, but um, I went outside and I was kind of looking around and and on this hillside behind the cabin, I saw a trackway. Could have been rabbits. Could have been deer. Who knows what it was? But I wanted to get up there and take a look at it. And I thought, well, I'll just kind of make my way around. I'll get up there and just check it out. And I was trying. Every way I went, I ended up getting stopped, you know, trees down, something, you know, something always blocked me. Now, Brent, I'm, you know, I'm six foot, 220 pounds of, you know, fairly healthy, you know, I, I'd been on the woods quite a bit, but I couldn't get through the snow. I was literally crawling on my hands and knees trying to go up this little hill. Wow. And while I was doing that, I, I heard this definitive, no question about it. It was a solid piece of wood. It a solid piece of wood, just crack one time. And I, and I sat and waited because you, you hear, you know, it always happens in threes. It always happens in threes. So I listened, never heard it again. And after what seemed like a couple minutes, it was probably just 20 seconds or so. I, I kind of turned around. I'm sitting there, you know, in, in the snow and I take my binoculars because the sound came, seemed like it came from a distance away. I took out this pair of binoculars I had, which was pretty high powered, which was great. And I'm looking at the other mountains and there was a, uh, I, uh, it was a a figure walking uh, with no problem at all, by the way, in the same stuff that I'm crawling through, uh, just with looking down at its feet. Its arms are down to its side. It wasn't flailing its arms, trying to keep its balance or, or you know, waving really far like Patty did. You know, it wasn't like that. It was just walking with its arms down to the side and uh, just walking through the snow with no problem at all. And, uh, it, I've watched it for a minute and I'm in my mind, I'm going, you know, you know, you, you talk about the psychological aspect of seeing something, yeah. you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm questioning myself, like, what am I seeing? You know, what is this? You know, is this a person? Right. Is, you know, this can't be a bear. You know what, 
you know, it's walking way too fast to be a bear. It's, it's walking through this stuff. So it can't be a person, you know, and I'm, and I'm trying to rationalize it. It goes behind this little thicket of bush. And I, and I thought, Oh my God, my camera, you know, so I get my camera ready, waiting for it to come out the other side. And this camera was nice. If I could have gotten a picture of it, I could have zoomed in and gotten detail and everything else, but it never came out the other side. So it must've gotten behind there and then went down the mountain the other way. And, uh, I'm like, why did I not take a picture of that thing earlier? Yeah. And and you're psychologically, you, you I don't care, you you can't help it. My, my I'm like, I'm looking at this thing. How could I not have taken a picture of it? But my mindset wasn't, you know, let me take a picture to prove anything to anybody. My mindset was, what am I looking at? You know, how do I how do I rationalize what I'm seeing? You know, so. I didn't even think to take a picture because people ask and I'm like, yeah, yeah, that would have been smart, but I didn't, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, well, I was really far away from it. Um, it, you know, it wasn't. And so in, in my mind, I personally believe, yes, I saw a Bigfoot. I, I think that in my mind, based on everything I've ever done in the field, that was a Bigfoot. So I believe I did, but you know, I, I can't prove it. Well, that's really incredible. And, and you know, that comes up all the time, especially among the skeptics. Like, well, there's there's cameras everywhere. Why aren't people getting photos? And why are all the photos right. blurry? But I don't think people can understand seeing something that just defies our understanding or our paradigm. It's like, whoa. I mean, even though you were, you were ready for them to be real and you were pursuing that truth, but when you're faced with it, it's a whole different situation. There's many people that that have said, I forgot I even had a camera. You know, it was just the, the, <laughs> exactly. that exactly powerful of a moment. So, and and the, yes. the brevity of those encounters, how long did, did you s- suppose that you watched it? Probably watched it for about 10 seconds, probably. Um, right. Nine, 10 seconds. I mean, it's in, right in that ballpark. And, and you know, you, you make a good point with the camera because, uh, you know, always being blurry. And uh, Derek Randalls, who loved this guy to death, he, um, he did a an outing and he did a, he did a, a test, right? And this was genius in my opinion, but so he takes a guy in a Bigfoot suit and he sticks him out in the woods, right? The guy's wearing a Nord's vest, by the way, so that he doesn't get shot by any hunters or anything, you know, <laughs> and he takes this group of people and he tells them, he tells them at some point, he's somebody in a Bigfoot suit is going to jump out in front of us. Let's see who can get the best picture of it. Right. And there was like 12 people there. They're walking through the woods. The Bigfoot jumps out, runs across the path, and, and out and out of view. All right, out of twelve people who were had cameras ready, knowing this was going to happen, one person got it on film at all, and it was just a blur as it went out of out of frame, out of out of uh, view. So <laughs> when you when you and and, and I love that test because it, it does it it explains the psychology of it because you're you know even when you're ready you're not ready you know you you don't know when it's going to happen so you know and these things are so incredibly fast and they're elusive and why would somebody think that there's going to be very many pictures that aren't blurry you know it it, it, right. it it would it would surprise me to find one that wasn't you know so that's a that's a great great point yeah it's it's incredible and and from what i understand and i i've only done bigfoot research like one time I went out and checked out a uh, supposed structure and that was really impressive. But I actually went on an expedition one time and, but I don't have a lot of experience, but going by what has been said, the average Bigfoot encounter is only a few seconds long, you know, like possibly under right. five. And, and so sure. unless you're, you like got it up to your eye and are ready to go, that's going to be over yeah. before you can even capture a frame, sure. you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, by the time your mind says, oh my gosh, that's a Bigfoot, it's gone. Right. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it, to get a, to get a picture, you're, 
in order to get a picture of a Bigfoot, in in my opinion, a good picture of a Bigfoot, I think I think you're going to have to outsmart him. I think you're going to have to um, sit and wait, you know, and hope he comes through, right. you know, because you, you you're not going to stumble across one, you know. They're you know those woods are their is their house. You right. know, they know their house. They know if there's an intruder. You know, if you're in bed asleep and somebody breaks into your house, you're going to know it. You know, and then once you know that, you think for one second, you you, you don't know all the hiding places, and they know your house better than you do. Right. Of course not. Right. You know? So, so they know you're there. They know you're there. Yeah, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Not not to mention, I think a lot of times nature gives us away. You know, like I I can't tell my wife and I go uh, we go mushroom hunting, and uh, we go out in the out in the forest out here and up in the mountains. And inevitably, a crow or a raven will just start cawing and cacking, or or the squirrels will start making weird noise. And it's like, yeah, yeah, they're they're alerting. And so, just like you say, if this is their home, they know the sounds that are normal and peaceful, and they know when when animals are disturbed about something. So they're they're really have to be well onto us before we would even possibly catch a glimpse. I agree, holds hard. Hundred percent. Yep. Hundred percent. But yeah, it's uh, but it's fun. I mean, you, you you've got to go out. If you if you go out, you've got to go out with the mindset of, um, get get a sight, have a sighting, or or something. It's so rare yeah. that if you go out expecting it, you're 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 not gonna have a good time. Sure, you go out, enjoy nature, have a good time, enjoy your friends, you know, and just and just enjoy it. And then if something happens, boom, you know, you've, you've just made a camping trip into a, into a, just a, an awesome experience. Right. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Hold. Depends on the nature of the encounter, but I will say, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly because I think, I think you're right. Um, that when, when you go out looking for it, you know, I, I think it changes the thing and changes the, the, the whole situation. But I also, uh, think that like 99% of people witnessing Sasquatch were not even looking for it. They were out doing, like you say, they were hiking, they were camping, they were fishing, you know, or just driving. And and suddenly, sure. boom, it's there. And and yeah, I think that you're absolutely right. Do do what you love or, or whatever. But do you think that there are ways to make yourself more interesting to them? so that they might come closer or have you pondered that thought? I, I think I, I yeah. And I, and I, I personally, I believe just be yourself. Don't, don't. Okay. Look, if, okay, let me back up. Cause that's a great question. <laughs> and I want to, I want to answer this thoroughly because it's a great question. If you perceive yourself or you portray yourself, I should say, if you portray yourself as you're hunting something, you walk different, you act different, you, you're quiet, you're sneaky, you know, you're every animal in the woods is going to shut up and hide from you. You know, you walk through, um, you know, you, you just sit at your campsite and drink a beer and, and play music and do what people do when they're camping. Now you're not being perceived as a threat. You know what I mean? So if you portray yourself as a hunter, everything's going to hide from you. If you portray yourself as somebody out camping, having a good time, things will be interested and they will come and look at you and check you out and investigate you. That's when you hope to catch them. That's a great take. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly because I, I don't know, you know, whether or not they're telepathic. I've heard of the mind speaking stuff and that, you know, they sure. they can tell your intentions. But I will say, and this is something I've said on on my show's here and there, but I thought this was really interesting is that, you know, dogs can pick up on the vibe that you're, that you're sending or people's dogs when they're yeah. problem dogs, according to the Caesar, the, the dog whisperer, it's 99%. It's the owner that's causing these dogs, to, you know? And so animals do pick up on that stuff and you're right. Um, <laughs> we are out there do with that them. very test with your dog, do that very test with your dog. When your dog's just sitting there and doing whatever he's doing, just get up and walk past him normally. All right. Don't, don't be, don't run. Don't do anything. You know, just be yourself. Just walk past him. 
then once you walk past him, turn around and try to sneak up on him and watch his behavior. His ears will go back. His head will go down. He'll be like, "Uh uh-oh, (laughs) uh-oh. And it's because he perceives you as coming after him. There's Now there's a danger, you know? There wasn't a danger when you got up to walk past him because he's your best friend. There is a danger when you're sneaking up on him with your hands like you're going to choke him, you know? He's going to, he's going to, oh, what happened? What's going on? You know, right. he does perceive that dogs are hundred percent dog. I know dogs better than most. And I'm telling you, dogs are a lot smarter than people give them credit for. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree totally. And, and yeah, I, I don't claim to be an expert, but yeah, I think that's, it's a great take that animals can, at least I, they must have some, a real strong sense of empathy. Another thing I've actually experienced, and I can't say it was anything that I, I mean, I don't know that it was a Bigfoot or whatever, but there was one sure. time where I was, I, I was called up to a friend's house because their dog wouldn't settle down and, and they, the, the husband was out and, and the wife was home alone with a small baby and they called me, you know, she called me and said, the dog won't shut up. It just wouldn't settle down. It was an outside dog and it just was barking like crazy. So, so I made the journey up there and I, and I was able to get the dog settled down. And once it settled down, I realized the forest was dead still, like nothing, not even crickets were, were, were making noise. Have you ever experienced that? That dead oh, silence? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, uh, freaky. We, uh, we'd gone into Oregon and, and I, you know, I've been, I've researched in, gosh, I don't know, 17, 20 states now. I don't even know what it is. It's a lot. Um, I've been all over the country researching Bigfoot, you know, and I've been out in places that, you know, no one's ever been before. And, uh, it, and all the times I've been out, I've had one sighting, you know what I mean? Sure. But I, but these little things like you're talking about, like everything just going quiet, you know, you're out there, man, and you're in, and it's like this, you, you, you literally feel the energy change, you know, <laughs> from, from, Oh, this is great. We're out in nature to wait a minute. And, and it's the same thing. Just now it's opposite. Okay. Mm-hmm. You sense something is coming in, in this, in the sense, what, what makes you sense that is those little things like the, 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 the forest getting quiet. Uh, you know, you don't hear crickets anymore. The bullfrogs, you hear them splash in the water. You know, you, yeah. these little things that you don't normally hear when you're camping. Now you don't hear it. You know, you, there's nothing, you know, it's just quiet. Yeah. And, uh, and it is, it's uh, it's a little unnerving because you know, something is somewhere close and it can probably see you, you know, yeah. and, and it's going to be a predator, <laughs> you know, sure. cause everything doesn't get quiet over things that aren't a predator, you know, they're, they're not threatened by anything else. If, if they're, if they're threatened, they shut up and they hide. If they're not threatened then they keep doing what they're doing. Right. You know, I, I think the biggest surprise for me of that is the crickets because you think about bugs and they're, I mean, they're just, uh, you, you seem to be just aware of their immediate presence or their immediate area, but it's like every cricket everywhere. I couldn't hear a pin. I could have heard a pin drop. And I was like, right. Wow. It was, and, and somebody, somebody described it and I can't remember who, but they described it as like the forest holding its breath. And that's really what it felt like. And I was holding right. my breath, yeah. but you know, just yeah, after. That, that's a great explanation. Yeah. And, and then after a little bit, then finally the, the crickets come, come coming. But man, my head was on a swivel, just, you know, looking and looking. I didn't see any. It was pitch dark up in the mountains, but I just felt that. It was like, oh, man, this doesn't feel good at all. But, you know, I couldn't just leave. So, uh, and once the sure. noise returned, then I was like, okay, good. Okay. All right. I, I, we're back to normal here. Good. It was like the reset. Right. right. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. And, and, and that's a, and, and that, the, the phrase, it's like the forest holding its breath. That's a, that's a, that's a really, that's a great term. That's a great way to put it because that is, that is what it feels like. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this, Ed, uh, you know, I think, um, since we're talking about Bigfoot and, and I've got a million questions about this and, uh, sure. have you researched around the United States, like several different places or is it more regional? Oh no, all over the place. I've been. California, Oregon, Washington, Montana, um, gosh, let's see, Florida, Tennessee, Alabama, um, Georgia, um, Ohio, Kentucky. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure there's more. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, all under, yeah. 
Well, my question is, do you find that there are big differences between the Bigfoot slash Sasquatch slash Skunk Ape uh, throughout these regions? Uh, do you notice that, because I've heard like the Big Thicket of Texas, they're, they're generally regarded as more aggressive and uh, right. and the, the Skunk Apes are generally generally regarded as a smaller type and I don't know if they're more aggressive. I don't think they're very aggressive by what I've heard of them. But, you know, but then some reports come in where they're, they're giant as well. But have you noticed sure. a marked difference between regions and reported behaviors? Well, I have. And I've actually had a very, very similar conversation because of that feeling. I had that. I asked Jeff Meldrum the exact same question. You know, like, what's, you know, what, why is there a difference? And, you know, is, is it like, like a dog, for example, you can have a German Shepherd, a Collie and a, a lab, you know, they're all dogs, mm-hmm. but they look and act totally different, you know? And, uh, so, and, and Dr. Meldrum explained that to me and he says, well, it has to do with the region, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, yes, they're going to be bigger, bulkier. They're going to, you know, their hair is going to be thicker and more, more dense, you know, whereas in Florida with the skunk ape, they're going to be, as you said, smaller because the, because it's so hot there, you know, they, there's no reason to store the fat, you know? They, uh, they're going to be hot there. They're going to, you know, they're, I'm sorry, they're going to be smaller. They're going to have long, thin hair so that, you know, it can, the hair could be, you know, the skin can breathe better, you know, and he's explaining to me these differences and, and there's nothing, there's never been anything that I've ever seen to me to suggest that if, if, if you're built different, you're also going to act different, you know, a, sure. I don't know, I guess a, you know, a bigger Bigfoot that, uh, um, like the Pacific Northwest or the Ohio Grassman or um, the, uh, you know, the in the Texas thicket, like, you know, the way over there in East Texas, those are, you know, those are bigger animals, you know, so they're going to be more aggressive and more protective. If you're a smaller animal, you're maybe you're going to be timid. You're going to run and hide, you know, so, so I think the size of the animal, depending on the region, also determines their behavior. So, it wouldn't surprise me that a smaller one would be a little more elusive and want to hide because it's not as big. It doesn't come across as threatening, you know. Yeah, it's just, it's really occurred to me. And and the kind of as, as a follow up, and this is a question that I've asked several uh, Bigfoot researchers throughout the years. But uh, mm-hmm. one thing that uh, always puzzles me is that the market differences in reports, some look like like a chimpanzee, some look like a uh, right. patty, which is, you know, just basically like almost a relic hominid. Uh, and sure. then there's others that almost look human-like, except they're covered with hair. I mean, they're just... Some people have described them as just you know, handsome, like the features, the the chiseled jawbones and such. And are, do you think we are talking about different branches of the same species when, when we're hearing these? Or do you think it's like a biodiversity, much like with humans, the varied looks that we can have? Sure. I, I think I think you'd have to take it a, another step. Okay. You know, I think that, and, I, and I've had that same thought. I've, I've often wondered why the the definitions and the descriptions are so different, you know? Yeah. And, um, I think, I think you got to go back to perception, you know, mm-hmm. look at the witness. Okay. The witness, if, uh, if, if whatever it is scares you, their description is going to be a scarier description. If somebody like myself who had the description from something really far away, you know, mm-hmm. and I had, on, honestly, all I saw was a silhouette. So I didn't see any definition. There's nothing to describe except the way it walked. But if, if you're, if you have a sighting from a distance and you don't feel threatened, your definition is going to be, you know, your description is going to be maybe something softer, you know, but kinder, you know, more human. Whereas, you know, so, so I think that plays a huge part in the differences in the descriptions is the mindset of the person having the experience. Are they scared? Are they not scared? How close was it? You know, these things. And, and there's, and there's this, (laughs) <laughs> it's unwritten rule that if 
if you say something is nine feet, it's probably seven. If you say something is 12 feet, it's probably eight. You know what I mean? It's, there, it's sure. sightings are, things are also exaggerated. Not that they're lying. That's not what I'm saying, but they're exaggerated because in their minds, that's, that's, that's what it appears to be, you know? Yeah. So, you know, you, you, people will describe things different than they were, which is why, I mean, I mean, even in court today in in, in courtrooms, human testimony isn't taken as serious as it was 20 years ago, because now we're learning that their memory doesn't work the way we always thought it did. You know, it, it fills in blanks. If you can't see the eyes and your mind fills in those blanks and you're scared, those eyes are going to be red. You know, they're going to be scary. So, you know, if you're, if you're filling in those blanks and you're not scared, then the eyes might be more human like. So I, I think, I think that has the biggest part to do with why people's descriptions are so different. Okay. That's, just, that's, that's what I think. No, I think that's a, that's a fantastic take. I've never heard that response before. And I, and I, and I agree. I think that everybody sees things differently and, and especially in a terrified state versus a curious state versus, you know, whatever emotional response they have that will weigh in on what they see. That's a great take. Um, now, what about things like, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the Beast of Seven Shoots, the 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 Bigfoot looking creature that seems to have like a baboon type muzzle. Um, do you think, and that, yeah, I'm sure you've seen the photo of uh, that baboon muzzled um, creature. Are you familiar with that one? I, I are you talking about the one that was in Florida? Uh, well, I I think it was Ohio, but I might I've be never heard. Okay, well, I've never heard the the term seven shoots, so I, I'm not sure. Sure, I, I I'm actually unfamiliar with that story. Okay, well, apparently the, uh, somebody was at this state park and and they were walking through and they and they had a you know they're, they're taking photos and stuff and they you heard motion or whatever. As far as I know, that's the background of it, um, which I'm right. paraphrasing probably poorly, but. They did capture a photo of what this was, and and on, on examination, it looks like a, a Bigfoot type creature carrying something white, and it has like a baboon type muzzle. And some people have described that as a, a gugwe, which uh, apparently is a, a separate kind of creature that it, it's a different type of Bigfoot or whatever. However, you want to categorize that, but the white thing was apparently uh, somebody's full size poodle dog that it was carrying away oh i do remember that i do that was that's been several years ago right. i do remember that picture yeah 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 so what do you make of that um i, I i'm gonna be honest I, I haven't delved into it i mean sure. I, I do remember seeing the picture okay um and it does look like it's carrying a dog so you know i, I <laughs> that's an interesting photo i i've i i have seen the photo but i i I don't know enough about it to really have an opinion, you sure. know, to be honest. Okay. I, and I, you know, I don't want to make something up for the show. I just sure. would rather be honest and just say, you know, I don't, I don't really have an opinion on it. I will say I do remember the photo yeah. and I do remember thinking, well, that's interesting. So, right. um, it looked authentic. It looked real. Uh, yeah. didn't look like it was faked in any way. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting photo though, but yeah, yeah. no, I appreciate your yeah. frankness because, you know, I, I, I don't know what to make of it either, but you know, just hearing hearing these these different descriptions again. But I think you're right. Uh, a lot of it probably boils down to perception, and that's a really really good take. Um, yeah, I, I think this phenomena is incredible because it's it's like most of the accounts are are seem very peaceful. Uh, they seem to be not going out of their way to hurt people, which I think is good. Sure. What do you think about the uh, the you know what do you think is going on in do you think that, you know, the different kind of reports has to do with an emotional range that they have much like us? Like, you know, so you catch them on a bad day, you're going to get a bad response or, or do you think generally it's always at risk for really being a bad situation? Uh, I, I, that's a, another great question. And, and I, and I'm going to, uh, you know, we, we keep kind of bouncing off dogs here and I'm going to use dogs as an example, you know, dogs, just like any other living thing they have bad days you know like like you just said you know they um you know my my dog will you know he'll get a little testy when he's having a bad day you know <laughs> and uh you know if i 
get too close to something I'm not supposed to get too close to, he'll let me know. Like, that's mine. Leave it alone. You know? <laughs> and if, you know, if he's having a good day, it's like, Hey dad, let's play with this, you know? So mm-hmm. it, 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 it's a hundred percent right. I think that their personalities, like any other animal, why would they not have good days and bad days? And, and you're right. You know, you, you, you sneak up on one and, and he doesn't, maybe he, maybe he notices you too late. He's not going to be happy about that. You know, he's going to be loud and abrasive. You know, he's not going to be happy that you were sneaking up on him, you know? And, uh, but if, you know, if he's out there and he sees you coming and he's like, oh, this ought to be fun. You know, he, he's just going to hide and didn't move on with his day, you know, yeah. it's not going to bother him. So, so I, I do think that, that, that the type of experiences people are having absolutely, absolutely could vary based on the personality of the animal. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would agree with that. I, I, I'm just always curious what people think because obviously we just don't know much of anything, but we have a lot of ideas about what it could be. And and honestly, yeah. you know, a lot of people discount the anecdotal evidence, but I think that that's huge, you know, because I think through the collective reports, if, you know, if they're, if they're referenced and, and uh, you know, there's background research into that, when people have experiences, I think that's incredibly valuable, even though it's often dismissed by uh, maybe the sciences and, and by authorities on the subject. Mm-hmm. I think the I think the, the experiences of people are an incredible, you know, collectively are an incredible maybe profile. It gives you an idea of the way these things behave, uh, at least in yeah. the in the varied experiences that people report. Right, right. And, that, and that's true. And I, you know, I've. I'm all about the science proving the existence. I'm all about it. I, I really am. But there's the part of the whole science um, side of this that, that I also find frustrating. You know, for example, you know, you, you can get a hair a hair sample and they say, you know, and, and all it comes back is, you know, unknown. You know, and I've, sure. I've seen that happen. You know, I've heard people talk about it. I've seen the reports. I've seen it, you know. Yeah. Why not take... And this, and only science can do this. Only scientists can do this. But why not take that hair, and instead of saying it's coming back as an unknown primate, why not call it Animal X? Give it a name, right? Yeah, yeah. Give it a name. Put it in the database. Okay. Next time you find a hair, if it doesn't match that one, you don't know what it is. Call it Animal Z or Animal Y or Animal B, whatever you want to call it. Put that in. Now let's see when when somebody has a hair and they say, well, it's an unknown primate. Well, does it match animal A or B or X or Y or Z or you know? Let's let's start let's start categorizing what we're finding, and then see what matches that. You know, and I don't know why we don't do that, but we don't. Science doesn't do that, and it's that's one thing I find frustrating. I'd wish science would kind of say, okay, you know, at least there's a chance these things are real. You know, so let's give it a name. You yeah. know, don't call it a Bigfoot. Don't call it a Sasquatch. Just call it animal X. It doesn't matter what you call it. It's irrelevant. It's not going to change what the, what the, what the evidence is, you know? Right. So give it a name and see what matches that later. And why isn't science more excited about that fact? It's like, well, it comes up as unknown. Well, there you go. You've got something that you don't know. Why aren't you guys getting excited about that and pursuing it? You know? Well, yeah. Well, I'm, let me answer that question. <laughs> sure. That's another that's a good question. And I, and, and I, this is another part of that frustration with the science edge of everything they don't trust the people who are collecting the evidence that's okay. the problem if uh if you don't trust the people collecting the evidence then you're not going to be all excited about the evidence they're collecting right sure because it's like well ah, maybe they touched it maybe they went to the zoo and got that off a, a gorilla and they rubbed their fingers on it so it came back as an unknown primate because it has human dna and champion. who knows you know but if, if you don't trust the people getting the evidence, they're never going to take the evidence serious. And, you know, you see that in other things as well. If you have a, um, if there's a court case and um, somebody doesn't have a private investigator's license and they're not experienced for 20 years, they're, they're not taken very serious in court when they talk about evidence they have found in, in a court case, you know? Oh, sure. But if, you're, but if you, but if you are uh, a, you know, certified private investigator, then your then your word is gold, you know. But it it's like the certification only means that you've taken a test. That's it, you know. Right. It doesn't mean that what the other guy did was wrong. 
but now he's not taken seriously, you know? Yeah. So I, I think, I think science should number one, if, okay, if you're getting tired of getting evidence from people you don't trust and start teaching people, make an effort to teach people the correct way to collect evidence. You know, mm-hmm. once, once you, people are understand that and they know how to collect the evidence, then science should trust the evidence more. And I think we would have, maybe we could get to that next step where we're giving it a name or a classification as opposed to just writing it off as, eh, it's unknown. We don't know what it is here. You can have it back, <laughs> you know, yeah. you know what I mean? And I, I think that that's, I think that's where science, that's where science is dropping the ball in this whole, in this whole Bigfoot genre. Yeah, I think you're right. But I, you know, I know that, um, Dr. Maria Mayer does workshops here and there when she can. Uh, of course, she's from uh, Expedition Bigfoot, along with Russ sure. and Ronnie. Um, but right. she does workshops uh, about evidence collecting. And I think that's awesome that she's doing that because I think people need to know. And, and she, of course, being a doctor and a biologist, would know, you know the proper procedures for doing that. And it, and it, would, be, it would be neat if, if she would develop a curriculum like that that could be you know, uh, some kind of certificate cur- a curriculum that people could earn that, sure. you know, after maybe demonstrating proper evidence collection and, you know, techniques that that would right. at least lend more credibility. But you're right. I mean, I know that there are many people out there doing it that really do know how to collect evidence, but you're right. Unless you've got a piece of paper or some, some, uh, Absolutely. pedigree to that effect, it's going to be dismissed. Now, not taking it seriously. Right. Exactly. Now, and and this is kind of walking to the to the more conspiratorial edge of this, but do you think there's there's an active cover up of the Bigfoot phenomena? Um, no, I I don't think it's a cover up per se. I I personally think that there. I mean, do do, do I think the government knows more than they say? Yes. Okay. Do I think there's a specific cover up? Yeah, probably not. Um, I think there's information that isn't getting out. You know, sir, but I don't think it's necessarily a cover up. Uh, there's too many people are out there looking for the same thing, you know, and, and, and let me say, Dr. Mayor Maria is an amazing woman. She's, yeah, she's awesome. She's so nice. She's a great person. Mm-hmm. And, and it's great to have her doing that. And, and I'm, and I'm glad she's doing that. In fact, I'm going to their camp out in June in Kentucky. Oh, um, fantastic. You know, I, I am, I am going to go to that. So I, um, I'm looking forward to, you know, learning as much as I can myself from people who know what they're talking about. So Maria is amazing and, and she, she does a great job. Yeah. All three of them are, are incredible people. And I've, I've met Russ several times uh, and just think sure. he's, he's just an ace and, and Ronnie's really fantastic too. Uh, I liked him. Yeah. Russ, Russ, Russ really shouldn't be on the show. He has no experience. He's not a very nice guy. Um, he's uh he's man. He's, he's, he's a, horrible person. I don't know why anybody would even have him on a show. Um, Russ, if you happen to hear this, um, dude, don't even call me anymore. <laughs> Nobody likes you. Here's, well, uh, here's my disclaimer. Me and Ronnie are great. <laughs> here's here's my disclaimer. The opinions of Ed Brown do not reflect the paranormal world. <laughs> right. Right. Actually, Russ was great. I, yeah, I love Russ to death. He's a, he's a great guy. Um, Russ and I have been out on I don't know, gosh, countless excursions. We've been, yeah, and walk, yeah. Russ, and I've been out quite a bit together. Um, he's a great researcher, and I'm just teasing him. The uh, <laughs> Russ, you know that. So, <laughs> did you ever carry his back? <laughs> no, I have no interest in carrying that back. He is. He has told me, if listen, if I had put that on as many times as he said, try this on, I'd probably be broken down with a broken back. No, I have no interest in putting on that whatever it is, 103 pounds or something, whatever it is, yeah. pack and haul that thing around. No, no, no. Leave it, leave it in your tent. Bring you a bottle of water. You don't need that. You don't need that with you when we're out, you know. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. He, I won't, I won't pick it up. I'd have to hire a Sherpa to do it. <laughs> That's <laughs> right, pretty right, funny. right. I've seen that thing in person and it's, and it's a beast, but, but Bruss is a beast too. I mean, that guy is really, really yeah. strong, but, um, Ed, this has been incredible. I've really loved our discussion, and I'm really honored to have you on the show. And I know we got a lot more ground to cover, so I'm hoping you'll come back and do this again and again 
uh, to cover some of the other things, the paranormal and, and UFO stuff. Sure. But you just, you just let me know, Brent. And I, you yeah, look, man, I, I, you know, I respect you guys. You guys are awesome. Uh, your show, I love your show. Um, thank you. I'm honored to be on it. I'm honored to be a part of it today. And, uh, and, uh, I hope that, you know, people just take what I say as my opinion doesn't mean, um, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm right. It just means that, you know, I personally believe, you know, these things and that's how I feel. No, that's, that's a great take. And, and I, and I agree. I, I, I certainly don't always subscribe to what people believe either, but I, I, I do believe everybody has a right to voice their opinion, what, you know, their experience and what they took from that. 100%. And, uh, you know, I, I respect everybody in that way, but, uh, you know, Absolutely. I've got a bunch of, I've got a bunch of experiences myself that I'm surprised people believe, but I mean, they're the honest God's truth, but you know, I've, I've always, I've right. always respected that people have received my claims very respectfully and I can, I can only right. do the same, but yeah, brother, it's been a, an amazing discussion. I, I will, Definitely be in touch with you, and we'll get you back and and uh, go down the rest of the roads that we can. Let's do it. All right. Thanks again, Ed. No problem, Brad. Thanks for having me on. All right, everybody. That's going to wrap it up for us today. So hope you guys enjoyed the show, and thank you again so much for all your love and support remember if you want to follow the paranormal portal probably the easiest way is to head over to paranormalportal.net and that's the home page for the paranormal portal and you'll find links to all of our different social media and uh, sites and information about the shows including our youtube channel which is youtube.com slash paranormal portal or just look for paranormal portal on on google or whatever search engine and you'll find links to our social media such as facebook instagram TikTok and uh, Twitter. So we're kind of all over the place. And we're spreading as, as well as we can. But anyway, thank you so much for the love and support. Y'all take care. And remember, we love y'all. Be good, be kind, be nice. Take care of each other. Help each other out. Find the magic in every day. And remember to laugh as much as you can. Until next time. Well, the only time she really turned with that famous yep. was when I rode across the creek and got down off the horse. She turned to look at me.